But you have to think it through and think it through and think it through. And that's the fun of it, he said. And it's also why you must not start until you've done sufficient dream time. He said, there's a danger of dream time because it can also be called procrastination. <laughs> and you've got to know where the dream time should end and the, um, <coughs> not let it sort of fall away into procrastination. And I think it's that. I learned from him that the great thing is never to face a blank sheet of paper, not knowing which road you're going to go down. I've tried to follow that really. So I've tried to be the poet that Ted Hughes is, and I've failed. And I've tried to be the storyteller that Robert Louis Stevenson is, and I've failed. But what I want to try to do one day is to kind of bring the poet and the storyteller together. Because, and in my next life, or when I grow up, I'm not sure which will come first. <laughs> I want to be a poet. That's what I really want. Because I think poets like Wilfred Owen, and it's been really, it's a privilege to be, an honor to be here. On this day in particular. You, if you look at your life, you've been in, in the army, you taught. When did you realise you had this vocation? And it is a vocation that you had. Oh, late. I mean, I um, had a little brief stay in life, isn't I, I, I got lucky. Very, very lucky. I've been lucky all my life. Um, I was lucky in my education. And, uh, I had one teacher at every Every school, um, one of my primary school in 75, from Roy Road in London, who um, read stories and I loved them. And in mother used to say, he was an actor or actress, depending on what generation you are. And she would sit on my bed, my brother's bed, and she would tell a story. And she had a beautiful voice and she was really beautiful as everyone's mother used to. And I love that moment of a quarter hour when she passed on the story she loved, but whether it was Walter Delaware or Kipling or whoever it was. Um, I think she passed it on to me. My teacher at St. Matthias carried it on. I went then to a very monastic school in Canterbury where I had one wonderful man called Mr. Sockley, who was my tutor. And uh, I was showing signs of becoming very keen on nothing in life but rugby. And he called me in at one point and said, Do you know, Michael, there really is more out there than rugby. Um, and I'm going to give you a book. And I want you to take it away and read it. And he gave me a copy, his copy of Wordsworth, Productive Poems, which I still have. And I read it from cover to cover. And I agreed with him, not that I stopped playing rugby, um, but I realized that there was power, great power in words. So then I. I was in a generation really, I'd like grown up just post-war, to finally find a way to solve the problems in both the country and the world, um, is education. So I think it, then I became a teacher and ended up being a writer by mistake because it was the only way to keep children quiet from three to half months. I love to have a great emotion in that, but honestly it was. I used to tell stories to the shut them up. Are there any teacher friends? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Three to half, three to half past is the death power. Because they don't want to be there. They want to go home. Children don't want to be there. Do you? Do you know what I'm talking about? Half past three. Do not. And uh, if you read a story that isn't working, and I did this one day, are you year six? Yes. I thought you were. <laughs> year six is a truly horrible. I have to tell you. <laughs> 35 years, 6 is like, 30, can you imagine 35 like that? You've got to keep them occupied. So this is what year 6s do when they're really fed up and they want to go and they look like this. And then you know as a teacher that you, you failed. That's it. And when I was reading a story once, I saw people like him doing that. And I, I thought, I can't bear this, I can't bear this. And my wife said, and the story isn't working, I told her that, she's a teacher too, she said, go back in there and tell them the story, make one up. And she also said, when you tell it, this was the best advice I ever had, even superior to Ted Hughes's, she said, when you tell it, you mean it. So I meant it, and little things like you know, listen to me. <laughs> and that was wonderful, I got <coughs> half past three telling the story, it was like a soap that would go on and on and on. <laughs> I got to the technique of rising the tension just about, well, for the bell went, and the bell went down. <laughs> you know, this, this marvellous thing which you teach the long for. 
oh, sir. <laughs> and I really wanted it to go on. It's just a great moment for me, so I, I liked it. That's why we can write. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm I'm loving. I was a child once. <laughs> <laughs> don't look at me like that, I was. <laughs> I was a child once, and we, we tend to forget that, and that shows the most important my life was memory. And it's a memory of my own childhood, of my own growing up. Which was interesting, I was lucky, it wasn't easy, and that's probably quite lucky too. Because there are, there are many uh, issues that came up. I was sent away um, from home to, to boarding school. Very, very young, but then everyone was. I'm not complaining about it at all. It's just that uh, it raised many issues when you were very, very young about uh, loss and grieving, which you did every every time when you went back at the beginning of term, um, and joy when you came home. And then I suppose you remember these things. I'll give you an example. Um, I, I discovered I could feel like this. I discovered I, discovered I was very good at lying. <laughs> So I did this, I had no idea why I did it. I did this, I looked at my little Timex watch and I said, oh, I really, I really hope the train's going to be on time because the Queen's coming for tea. It <laughs> 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 was this completely marvelous moment when I looked up. All of the world. <laughs> the child thing. Uh, the other was animals. Well, um, I spent five years of my childhood on the Essex coast, a place called Bradwell, uh, on the sea. And it was on my school holidays when I came back. It was the huge joy of my existence was to get on my little red rally bike and, and cycle out past St. Peter's Chapel, which is an ancient Saxon chapel. And I go in there and I say prayers. Um, but that was thanking God for coming home again and for not being beaten last term. I mean, that's that kind of way I was thinking of it. And then I would leave my bike inside the chapel where I knew it wouldn't get pinched and go for a long walk along the sea, along where the great brown soupy North Sea is coming in. And you saw hares, and you saw herons, and you saw the birds of the sea. And that world fascinated me. And then, lucky, 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 later on when I met Claire, she had also done the same thing, but down in Devon walking the deep lanes of death, as Teddy was called. And became fascinated by that, and she knew the good it had done her, the way it had, had cheered her up, and we agreed about that hugely. And she is a teacher, and I am a teacher, for a world who cannot teach her in this school, which is simply not possible. This is the right of every child, no matter where she or he is, to experience this. This is their world, and they should know the joys and the beauties of it. And so we started this thing, Farmers for City Children, she did anyway, and we, we then spent 30 years doing that. People still doing it, but sort of retired from it in a way. Um, but it goes on, and the idea is to bring kids from cities to live and work on the farm and be in the countryside for a week of their young lives. So, what did that mean? It meant I was in the countryside, I was working with animals, and here's the thing which is unique and why I write about it. I think animals, in a sense, don't particularly interest me for themselves. <coughs> To me, they're like people. They're nice animals and they're nasty animals. They're nice people and nasty people. They're part of us, our world, part of our species, and we're learning more and more how we are destroying that relationship. It seems to me to be really important to knit us together, ourselves with our environment. So that's what we've been doing with these children for years and years and years now. And I've been in this wonderful, unique position of watching children interact with animals, many of them for the first time in their lives. So there's the fear sometimes. Uh, and then there's the a wonderful triumph when they've lost the fear, and then it becomes a closeness. And the number of times I've walked into the yard where we live in Devon, and I've heard two children in the stable, and they're talking to the horse. Not joking, they're talking to the horse. And you realize these are two sentient creatures comprehending each other, and there's trust, and there's affection. And so I think it's that, it's that relationship. I think about how you've gone about your creation of stories and the telling of them, yes. and how Dickens did. We, we gain Dickens' message very quickly, what he's about. Yes. But yours are both simpler but deeper to me, reading your uh, stories. Mm. And they are about the non-judgmental role that animals take on to us human beings. Yes. 
which we are very lucky if we have one or two human beings doing that to us, but not so with animals. And it seemed to me that through, through the sort of world that you wanted to create, the non-war, but it was also this how we could learn with animals yeah. to behave better to human beings. Yeah. And that's what I am hoping now, all those who, who are heads here, we sign up and get lots of our young people from Birkenhead down to, on the waiting list to come to the farm to actually experience that. Well, that would give me great pleasure. It would be wonderful and really wonderful. So if there are people who go to tap my shoulder afterwards, and that would be really lovely. No, I mean, what you said, I, you said it better than I, I could say. That is absolutely what the purpose of all the writing and the, and the, the life has been, I suppose. It is making uh, that connection. And that connection is, is just fundamental and it, it helps us, yes. Helps us get on with each other. I mean, I know, for instance, when I'm, I mean, this is a bit of a story too, but when I'm trying to persuade a horse to come to me in a field, hands up those who have tried that. Now, you know what I'm talking about. I, I don't know if any of you have read uh, a, a newspaper called The Guardian. There's <laughs> 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 plenty here. <laughs> well, I, I wrote a really good book once about <coughs> called Twist of Gold. And I wrote this book, it was after wars, and because everyone liked wars, no, it's not true, but a lot of people don't like it, but it was liked, liked enough for my publishers to publish this Twist of Gold, which is about children growing up in an Irish potato famine and escaping across the ocean to America to find a, an uncle over there. So to me, it's one of my best books. And um, so I, they, the, the publishers had a great launch party because it was just after wars. And, the morning of the launch, the, someone in the Guardian, I do know the name, but I will not mention it, <laughs> wrote this horrible, horrible review of Tristan God. So I had to walk into this gaggle of 100 people, and all of them were looking at me, and they were all looking with their eyes, and you've seen the review. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it, it's, it's hard. With that one, I tried to break the mold. I wanted to go to Irish history which is not easy necessarily because it belongs to the Irish and I'm an English person doing it, there's that. I was also going to race because it's about um, these two kids getting over there and they're looked after by people who are black in America. If you write a history, you're, you're in territory, which is, which is difficult. So I try to challenge myself each time. And certainly with Flamingo Boy, the challenge there was very personal. I have a grandson um, who is uh, autistic and I had not come across um, autism in my life before. Those of us who haven't come across it, you'll hear about it from time to time, but um, someone who's such a autistic or whatever, but he won't be engaged with it because there's been no need to, really. But if it comes to your family, there is a need to, and um, it becomes part of your family life that Lawrence, as he, my grandson is called, um, is a fact and a welcome fact um, for his immediate family and for the wider family. Uh, but when he's there, you, you have certain issues, certain things that have got to be taken care of. Otherwise, he could hurt himself, or he could trip over things, or fall over, and or he can run away, all sorts of things like this. He needs looking up. He needs 24 hour care, basically. He's now 15, so he's big. And autistic children seem I don't know why they should be the case, but anyway, it's very, very big. Um, and I've learned a lot about him. I've learned how important touch is through someone else. It's weird. Smell. He loves smelling and touching. And in particular, he's very sensitive in his mouth. So, he, for instance, he is fascinated with CDs, not just to listen to them, but then to do this in his teeth. So every CD you've got in the house after a visit, that's <laughs> So there's this whole world of sensitivity, which we've all got. This is what's really interesting to me. We all have these things, which we, we sort of, because they can, we take it all for granted, our sense of touch and our sense of smell. He doesn't, the, the whole business, and he's very close to our fellow sentient creatures. So he will come up and he will smell you. Well, I'm not used to being smelled. <laughs> and, and I, you have to become a person that, and then you learn from that. You learn that actually we're doing that all the time. I don't want to sniff it at people, but that's part of the way we protect ourselves. We don't do that, but we are smelling each other all the time. And we are touching other, each other all the time. And these things are really important. And in a way, he's showing us this. He's show so I thought, no, I must, if I can, um, 
right to the end of the book. So I asked my son, is this acceptable? And uh, he said, well, frankly, anyone who writes a decent book about autism is really welcome. Because it's one of these things that sort of closes up a bit. And the more you can bring him into him, and, and, and he said, would you, would you call him Lawrence in the book? And I said, oh yeah, but I prefer Lorenzo. Fine, he said. <laughs> and um, so I, I wrote the book, and the more I got into that story, which is a story, by the way, set in the Carmel in France, also goes back to childhood. I love researching. The research makes my story. I was taken by a lady, so I did which one. No, no. <laughs> I was taken by the lady who was sort of showing around us around the area. She said, there are many hills around here, as you can see. <laughs> but Essex. <laughs> and uh, he sort of wild around. Wild around the story. And she said, I will take you to the only hill on my farm. She took me to this little pile of stuff <laughs> and said, let's get up on the top of this and I will show you something remarkable. She said, we are now on the highest point on my farm, one of the highest points um, in the Carmel. And if you look up there, there's the open sea. 2,000 plus years ago, the Romans came here and they built a fort. These are Roman stones we are standing on. This is the remains of a Roman fort. And they built a fort here so they could look out to sea, so that if any ships were coming in, there was fair warning and they could drive them off. In the Second World War, roughly 2,000 years later, the Germans came and they looked around on the marsh for the highest place and they found the Roman fort. So they built on it huge concrete, concrete gun emplacements and put two huge guns pointing out to sea because they thought the Americans were going to land there. Well, unfortunately for them, they didn't. They landed elsewhere. And when they had landed, the Germans decided, well, we'll blow those up. So they were completely unused guns. They didn't, well, they fired them for testing. But um, they blew blown up. And all the guns and the concrete flew off into the marshes and sank down, no trace of them. And what's left? The road walks. <laughs> and I just, I love that kind of um, discovery. Last discovery, and I will show you, was about your interest. I was completely fascinated by these flamingos. Um, and this lady said, well, we have to be thankful to England, Britain, about something. <laughs> I said, well, how kind of you. <coughs> and I said, well, there's a wonderful man who came here many years ago, and he stayed at his very house, and I got to know him, as was my good And he was a professor from the University of England. He'd come here, but he was to get a crisis with the flamingos. They'd gone, just after the war, they'd gone. They weren't coming into Greenland, or the Greenland Islands were sort of shallow lakes all around. And they're gone, they weren't coming back, they weren't coming back. And um, he heard about this and he said, I've got to say about it. So he left where he was on, <coughs> Robert, or Cambridge or somewhere, and went down there and talked to French people and discovered the reasons for these well. One, because of war damage, the level of water had been changed completely on the marshes, so that from time to time it dried out. What could happen now? The predators could come in, sort of badgers and foxes and, and wild boars could come through the marshes, across what was the bed of the lakes, and up onto the nesting grounds of flamingos and kill them. Plus, <coughs> local people were extreme, were starving at the time, and so they had been in the habit for years and years and years of stealing flamingo eggs to eat, which is quite understandable if they're starving. So one way or another, they were being removed, and they'd, they'd gone away. And he said, well, look, you have to get the government to change. So did you do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how to make a law? There should be no more stealing of flamingo eggs. The law was made. He went to all local people and said, we've got to get the water levels right, otherwise we're not going to put this right. They got the water levels right, and then they all sat there and they waited for the flamingos to fly in. And they did. <laughs> and then he, had, he, said that he was really upset because he, he thought this must change the situation. And it didn't come, it didn't come, it didn't come. And he was lying in bed one night, apparently, and he thought, well, of course they're not here. They have no homes to come to. Because you may not know this, but flamingos build these nests of mud. They're relatively high, and they're shaped with a sort of a bowl in the middle where you lay the eggs in the top. And because the water had gone up and down, it dried out and the animals had bashed them down, they weren't there and they were used to coming back to the same nest each year and remaking them a bit, just like swallows do a bit, but they had nothing to come back to. And so what this man did is he got all the local people and himself, thousands of them, and they went up there and they built with their bare hands from 
millions of mud. And they came back. <laughs> Which is why if you go to the car you will see thousands upon thousands of people. It's all down to the Brits. I think children cry sometimes too. They may be crying in a different way, but that's true. I think what it is, when children weep and they're very involved in maybe a particular part of the story, if I can take walls, it's the most obvious thing. Um, there's been this wonderful play of walls which has gone around. And the reason I know this is true is that I've been there in the audience time and time again, not too often, um, and seen the response of, of, of grown-ups and children coming out. Yes, you're right. Um, parents and grandparents are very often devastated and they come out to sort of doing this stuff. And the children don't. Well, why not? Because actually what the children want more than anything else is the horse and the soldier to find each other. It's got a happy ending. And they concentrate on this. Children have this wonderful ability, which I think is extraordinary, of stretching their imagination just so far as they can bear it. And the wonderful thing about those puppets is they're not flesh and blood. There is no violence, per se. It, it, it's imagined. Everything has to be imagined. And if they don't like it, they don't look away. They will simply turn down the volume of it on what they're feeling. They do that. They're very, very good at that. Choice. I know it's not. We know more about suffering and mortality and war. We've seen it longer, sadly, both in our national memories and in our weeks like this, and um, also on our televisions, whether it's been in Iraq or Afghanistan or whether it's Syria or wherever. We, we know it for what it is, much more. The children are getting to know it, and I just think they have a different perspective. So I think everyone reading a book like War Horse brings to it their own life experience and copes with it as best they can. And I've, I've met lots and lots of people who say, I will not go and see that play. I will not see those horses. And it's always adults, not children. Children will go and they just have this way, I think, of, of dealing with it. And I've read lots of stories of children which are deeply, deeply upsetting. Um, Sometimes I think I've done it wrong, though. They, they, you have to have, in a story for children, you have to have redemption. That has to be hope. Um, I think that's really important. Children must not be traumatized or devastated. But um, there is an important thing. You have to look them in the eye and tell them it as you think you've discovered it. The minute you start pretending or you start thinking, actually, they're in it or they don't understand this, then you pattern. And the worst thing you can do with children is to talk down to them and patronize them. They're, they're and unfortunately, just as intelligent as we are. <laughs> they happen to be a bit smaller, <laughs> more noise. Otherwise, they are like us. And you just look them in the eye and talk to them. And I, certainly, I learned as a teacher. Um, you, you must do that. It, it's about respect, finally. It's about respecting who they are. And um, here you are creating for your books uh, uh, an imaginary but real world. And now these books are taken from the printed world into other ways of communicating what you think. Yeah. Now, I've always assumed, the advice of me with you, that these books are part of you. Sure. But how do you feel when other people decide they're going to present your babies in a different way. How involved are you in, in that process? Um, and, and at the very end, can you tell us how your books have changed you? When you make a book, it is the most precious thing to you while you're doing it. The minute you hand it over to someone else and they read it, it becomes theirs. So any, any child, any adult reading a book, you lose yourself in your story, in that story. What have you got? You've got a print on the page which this writer has prepared. He's done it um, with the dreams in his head. He knows where it is. He knows the people. He sees, she sees, as she's writing these things down for you. But when you read it, it's up to you to interpret it. And you're going to interpret it the way you want it. So you, you're giving it to them. So basically, you're passing this skeleton of the story 
hope to someone, giving a few hints about what they might like to think, but better not to give too many hints, leave it to the reader, and then the reader will. So you're already sharing that if that is formalized into a play or a film, um, it's difficult because one other person is getting hold of that idea and making it their own, and then maybe they've got to, because a good book doesn't necessarily always make a good film. And what you really want if someone is going to film your book is it's going to be a good film. Um, and I haven't had a good film, but I have had a good play. And the reason it was a good play is that the National Theatre brought to it extraordinary talents in the world of theatre in terms of writing and directing and lighting and costume and music and brought it all to this story and then shone a completely new light on the whole thing. Even changed the ending, which I made a great fuss about. And at all times they consulted. That book was not this. I was there during all the workshops. Two years they workshopped this book. Right to start with, I was told they were going to, I mean, it was through the Pitts National Theatre, they were going to do a play book, and that were. And then they tell me they're going to do it with puppets. And I'm thinking, pantomime horses. <laughs> because what else do we do? I never thought of us. Life size puppets, they said. A wonderful company from South Africa, they're really brilliant. And I was disappointed immediately, and then I went up there and I saw a film of these three men operating this puppet giraffe, life size plus, across the studio. And I, I found myself crying. <laughs> what the heck is that about? It was utterly extraordinary. And what it was, I suppose, was that through this extraordinary gift, both the making of the puppet and the manipulating the puppet, they were creating <coughs> life. It was so moving. And I thought, why should they do that? Of course, that would be wonderful. And so it is. And then, at the end of the day, I'm just so grateful because what happened was that we still have the production out there, which means that an awful lot of people, I think about 8 million people have seen the play. So much of your life, from when you started this vocation of writing, has been in your mind. Your life is lived in your, your head. How has this life of giving of these stories related back to you now? How have you changed as a result? Well, this is why I'm a clergy person. She really does that question. My wife. Yes, she does. I'm a clergy person because she might tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's really hard, isn't it? it um, I hope, I hope, I hope. It hasn't changed me as such, but um, I feel. It's not to do with the writing, and it's certainly not to do with setting the books and stuff. I think what happens is you get older. At least it's certain anxieties drop away. And I don't say certainties um, so that I don't. Um, and what seems to happen is that we can relax into who we are, and we can stop striving quite so much. And I know as a as a teacher, I was hugely over-enthusiastic, and, um, and as a young writer, I was too, but as an educator, I was. And I still have that, but I stopped the striving. I feel much more contented in my skin now. But I'm not sure that's anything to do with the writing. Um, I do worry that I spent too much time doing the writing and not enough in terms of living because it does affect other people around you. There's no question about that. And I'm not sure that's entirely healthy for their life. But um, no, it's, it's, it's lovely to have got to 75. Clap when someone says something. I will stand up because I was told, and um, I've taken advice on this, that it's very, very good that your stomach muscles can stretch. It's true, isn't it? You know this, do you? You're a physician. Kind of. Well, you need to leave out. I am the kind of singer, just to warn you, I'm the kind of singer who sings in the bath. Hands up, you sing in the bath, hands up, you sing in the bath. Well, imagine me in the... No, no, no. Um, anyway, here's the song, blow my nose. Right. <laughs>
it comes from this wonderful word by a man called John Tams, who is the song maker in the play. Some of you may know he's a great folk singer. And um, it comes from a little hint of the two miles anyway. Fading away like the stars in the morning, losing their light in the glorious sun. Thus would we pass from this earth and its toiling, only remembered for what we have done. Only remembered, only remembered, only remembered for what we have done. Thus would we pass from this earth and its toiling, only remembered for what we have done. Only the truth that in life we have spoken, only the seed that in life we have sown, these shall pass onwards when we are forgotten. Only remember for what we have done. Only remember, only remember, only remember for what we have done. Thus would we pass from this earth and its toiling. Only And then plowshares and traces, the line on the land and the paths of the sun. Season by season we mark nature's graces. Only remember for what we story. Will the line hold? Will it scatter and run? Shall we at last be united in glory? Only remember. 